paleontologist at the uh, Society Museum Center, and also uh, vice president uh, in charge of science at the uh, museum. Uh, he is a uh, expert on plesiosaurs and other uh, uh, denizens of the uh, oceans, but uh, he is also uh, uh, quite an expert on the Dunkleosteus, who he is going to primarily talk about today, uh, one of the great uh, predators of the uh, Devonian period. Thanks, Rich. Yes, I hope you're not here under false <laughs> pretenses expecting to hear about uh, plesiosaurs, which is something that I, I typically talk about. Um, I felt that I wanted to do something a little different this year, and I got, I didn't, I guess I never got the title to, to Rich. <laughs> so I thought I would speak specifically about what I think is the most spectacular fossil ever to be found in Ohio, which is the, the great placoderm predator, Dunkleosteus. I thought I'd speak a little bit about the value of fossils and what they, they show us in the fossil record, particularly as this is uh, the year after the 200th anniversary celebration for, of Darwin's birth and the 150th uh, anniversary of the publication of The Origin of Species. So we all like fossils, I think, otherwise we wouldn't be here at the show, we probably wouldn't be at this talk. There are a lot of reasons for collecting fossils, but as a professional paleontologist and a museum scientist, uh, uh, museums collect and preserve fossils for a variety of reasons that uh, may have to do with the exhibition and education, of course. And I, I put some, uh, I think, rather interesting exhibit quality specimens on here, a range of things that we have at the uh, museum center. Uh, this is a local star. This is a local trilobite, Isotelis, many of you may be familiar with. Uh, this is from Brazil, South Dakota, Wyoming. This is an ichthyosaur skull I collected in Nevada. So a broad range of fossils from, from many areas uh, because museums, if they're conducting scientific research, do not concentrate just on the fossils of their local area, uh, but we as scientists are asking global questions uh, about the world. Uh, it's these, the answers to these questions do not restrict themselves to state boundaries, for instance. So uh, if we want to know about a particular group of animals, we may have to go farther afield. Uh, next slide. Um, why, why are fossils important? Why do museums collect them, particularly with a scientific research <laughs> bent in mind? Uh, well, some of the major reasons here, is, of course, fossils document the origin of major animal groups at points in the geologic record. They document the evolution of anatomical complexity. They document patterns within the fossil record that can tell us a lot about past environments or past organisms or past climates. And it, uh, they demonstrate change, global change, with a deep time perspective. Deep time meaning the geologic record, rather than, say, ecological time, where we are uh, living through it with our own personal experience, just to, you know, for lucky 100 years. But uh, whereas a neontologist, a, a modern biologist, looks at living ecosystems, paleontologists have that added deep time perspective. We can look way back in the record and again, look at, look at various patterns. So some of the patterns that we might see are, of course, that fossils document uh, changing patterns, faunal sequences through time. So here, the geologic time scale, which I hope in a very simplified fashion. Um, the Paleozoic here, the younger Mesozoic rocks, youngest Cenozoic rocks on the top, and changing organisms through time, and different sequences. And you can go around the world from place to place and find similar faunas depending upon whether you're in similar environments or not and see how those things change through time as you go up in the record. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, they illustrate change of organisms through time. That's the big thing re related to Darwin um, and uh, organic evolution. Fossils are the transitional forms that evolutionary theory predicts should exist. So in the case of horses, you start out with these four and five toed uh, so-called dawn horses in the Eocene until you get to the single-toed modern horse, for instance. Next. Uh, now, a lot of people in the general public uh, have this misconception. There are plenty of gaps in the fossil record, and every time we find a new fossil, we create two new gaps. Um, but just because there are gaps in the record does not mean by any chance that evolution is correct, and, and there are many, many transitional forms known. Uh, next, please. 
Uh, and Darwin himself recognized the incompleteness of the fossil record. There are many reasons for this, and if you've taken a geology course or read basic geology, you'll recognize some of the reasons why fossils are not always preserved everywhere and why we do have uh, an incomplete record. Not all the time is there, not all the fossils are there by any means. Next, please. And one of Darwin's geniuses is that he, he knew this and he predicted that new fossil discoveries would begin to fill in these gaps, where it wasn't creating new gaps. It's making gaps smaller. More gaps, but they're smaller. Okay. Um, <coughs> this is the holy grail right here of evolutionary theory. This is from one of Darwin's unpublished notebooks that's available in the, uh, online now, but it's, the original is in Cambridge University uh, Library. And here's where he says, he's got himself a little drawing here, uh, where he's got a branching diagram with various letters representing species. This is the public, the, the single uh, figure, the only illustration in the origin of species is uh, this tree of life, essentially. It's a schematic. It's hypothetical. You get these uh, letters re representing uh, individual species or higher taxa, perhaps, and diverging and splitting as they give rise to new species. So A becomes A prime. B becomes B prime later in time, yeah, as you go from the bottom to the top, older to younger sequences. But this, this figure here, this says it all. He's got this sort of sketched out, he talks a little bit about his theories, and he thinks, it says right up here, I think. This is, this is where it all starts to become clear to him. Next. And I'll show you that as an introduction, because I want to talk a little bit about the evolutionary relationship of Dunkelosteus and the Arthrodires, and I, I want to... <coughs> Make sure that, that you sort of get a feel for reading a, a, an evolutionary tree, or what a, a professional systematist would call a cladogram. It's a, a branching diagram of, of relationships. It's a, a nested hierarchy of relationships of organisms. So, birds and crocodiles, oh, and I should say that in this diagram, in evolutionary <coughs> relationship diagrams, or cladograms, there is no time uh, scale implied by these diagrams. It's just the, it's just the, the relationships. Uh, you can super, well, superimpose these on a, on a time scale, but th that's not done here in this, in this slide or the next one. So birds and crocodiles, in this case, share a more recent common ancestor at this node, branching node here, than either of them do with lizards, okay? And we call this group, in this case, Archosauria. But whatever set of relationships you're, you're, you're creating, you would, you would end up with a name, perhaps, that would have a, uh, be a descriptor for uh, a, a group of organisms that share a common ancestry. So, again, birds and crocodiles are more closely related to one another than lizards are. These three, birds, crocodilians, and lizards, share at this point a common ancestor more recently than they did with the, with the branch giving rise to mammals. And similarly, these three share a more common ancestor than amphibians. What would this node, what would you call that node right there? Or what would you call the group that's defined by that node? Reptilia. Reptilia. Yeah, yeah, reptilia. These are the reptiles, right? Uh, or, yeah. <laughs> we won't go any more specifically than that. That's good. All right, so uh, in a general sense, vertebrate, chordata, chordata, uh, vertebrates and, and their near relatives um, and the same, we can describe their relationships in, a, in that same stair-stepped branching pattern. Um, starting off at the base with invertebrates that are closely related to vertebrates. We have the cephalochordates here, which I'm sure if you've taken high school biology or college biology, you will have seen the amphioxus, branchiostoma. So we have the cephalochordates. The hagfish and the lampreys, two living jawless fishes, and a whole range of extinct jawless fishes. <coughs> you'll, you'll maybe uh, appreciate that these, although they have this nested relationship with one another, they don't form a natural group themselves. They don't branch off altogether at a single point. So fish is not a natural you know, scientific name. There's lots of different things that are fish-like. And they have various technical. So most of these jawless fish are, are going to be extinct here. Then we get up into the nathostones, which means the jawed vertebrates. 
Uh, we have living ray finned fish, uh, the typical fish of today, tuna and trout and that sort of thing. Lobe finned fish like lungfish and the coelacanth is an extinct group. The chondrichthians are sharks and their relatives. And what we're interested in here are the placoderms. This is the beginning of the nathostoma. So right here, this node is where we can define nathostoma or jawed vertebrates, the first things that have jaws. Now all these other animals have mouths, of course, but there's no movable jaw that opens and closes for these things. It's the placoderms for which Dunkleosteus is a member that, uh, uh, that first developed this, this movable jaw mechanism here. Um, these things in black are all still extant, these black lines, and 